Good morning. Thanks. Good morning. Good morning. I don't know that I turned that on. Yeah, it is. <laughs> you think by now I would remember to turn it on. That's a psychological issue with me. Uh, Keith is progressing and plans to return to teaching. He has uh, 32 high school students that go out to the University of Houston just for his instruction on cinematography, script writing, and things like that. And he plans to resume that. It's obvious that his mother and father have nothing to do with what he's going to do. Other than I've agreed to drive him. Which means I have to be in spring tomorrow by 6.30. That's okay, I get up early. <laughs> okay. anyway, thank you so much for your prayers. And please continue. And maybe one is that they should learn to honor their father and mother in our opinions on their health. <laughs> the first thing that keeps us from praying effectively. is that before we can really pray, we must have everything just right in order to pray. That is, that our lives need some fine tuning. The great traditions of prayer, we think, oh, we need to learn that before we really begin to pray. And we also think we need the philosophical questions that surround prayer before we begin to pray. That's not correct. We assume that prayer is something to be mastered, the one way at one, the way one masters algebra or electronics. In the original text of what I uh, put on the screen, it was algebra or auto mechanics, and I decided. <laughs> We've got to get into the real world with electronics. Such an approach coincides with the belief that life or success is defined by how competent or in control we are. Trying to become competent in prayer before we pray is putting the horse before the cart. We will learn... I really like this. <laughs> we will learn the great traditions of prayer, the philosophy, the philosophical questions surrounding prayer, <laughs> after we have become comfortable with prayer. That's a very important consideration, this becoming comfortable with prayer. When you begin with the idea that you have to have everything right in your life, to pray, it means you're not going to pray if you're serious about having everything right. I am reminded of uh, a married couple who, when they first got married, oh, some nearly 50 years ago, uh, the wife presented to the husband a box, just a small cardboard box. And she said to him, you are never to look in this box. Never. So he took the box and put it on the top shelf of the closet. And for nearly 50 years, he didn't look in the box. But the wife got ill. And so they decided that they needed to get their affairs in order. And uh, he said, well, what about the box? And she said, well, let's get the box and look in it. And he said, I haven't looked in it now. In all these years, I promised I wouldn't, and I haven't. So they got the box, and together they opened it. And in the box were their two little crocheted figures. Just two. And $95,000 in cash. And he said, well, you've got to explain the contents of the box to me. She said, well, when 
we first got married, my mother said to me, any time I got mad at you, I should knit a little figure. And he said, well, that's amazing. In all these years, you only got mad at me twice. But what's the $95,000? And she said, that's the money I made selling the little knitting figures. <laughs> make that appropriate to uh, the study of prayer, that's sort of the way we do the idea of prayer. We take it and put it in a little box and put it on the top shelf of the closet and don't really think much about it. The fact of the matter is we come to prayer with a tangled mass of motives, altruistic and selfish, merciful and hateful, loving and bitter. This side of heaven we will never ravel the good from the bad, the pure from the impure. What we realize, if we think about our prayer experiences, is that God is big enough to receive us with all our <coughs> mixture of emotions and characteristics. That is what grace means. We live by it, are saved by it, and we pray by it. <coughs> but we should pray. So. We're like little children coming to their parents with the craziest of requests. Sometimes we're grieved by their selfishness and meanness, but we would be more grieved if they didn't come to us with all their requests. We are glad that they do come, mixed motives and all. Now, that is how it is with prayer. We will never be pure enough to pray rightly. At least Maybe some of you are, and you can take over this next week. <laughs> Just as a child cannot draw a bad picture, as I was reading this and deciding to put it into the lecture, I thought, you know, that's right. Your child draws an awful picture. You never say that's awful. You say that's, that's wonderful. Well. We are accepted as we are, as we utter the most basic, the most primary form of prayer. It's called simple prayer. And it's the first prayer that we learn to do. In simple prayer, we bring ourselves before God just as we are. We don't try to separate it into parts. We simply and unpretentiously share our concerns and make our petitions. We share with God our frustrations, our fears, our anxiety. We ask for food, favorable weather, and good health. Simple prayer is egocentric. That's just the way we begin. There's nothing wrong with that. You don't stop praying because you're praying about yourself, but you will gradually elevate your prayer to where you're praying for others before you pray for yourself. Our desires, our wants, our concerns dominate the focus of simple prayer. We are the focus of simple prayer. Consider the prayer of Moses. Moses said to the Lord, Why have you treated your servant so badly? He's talking about himself, of course. Why have I not found favor in your sight that you lay the burden of all this people on me? Why me? Did I conceive all these people? Did I give birth to them that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a nurse carries a suckling child to the land that you promised on oath to their ancestors? That's a pretty powerful questioning of God. Did I give birth to all these people? The Bible tells us it was 600,000. Well, of course, that, that, that's not what happened. But yeah. oh. why is it going the wrong way? The fact of the matter is that we all come to prayer. I said that. What in the world? <laughs> How about that? <laughs> it's a 
amazing. I'm standing up here and it's doing its own thing. <laughs> well, I'm not telling the truth. What about Elijah and his curse upon the children who made fun of his bald head? That was a prayer. And uh, when he prayed it, when he turned around and saw that he cursed them in the name of the Lord, then two she bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the boys. What about Psalm 137 and verse 9? Happy shall we be who take your little ones and dash them against the rock. Oh, that's in the Bible? Yes, it is. And so that you won't think I'm guilty of taking it out of context. Let's look at it this way. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and there we wept when we remember, remembered Zion. On the willows there we hung up our hearts. For there our captors asked us for songs, and our tormentors asked for mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not remember you, if I do not see Jerusalem above my highest joy. Remember, O Lord, against the Edomites, the day of Jerusalem's fall, how they said, tear it down, tear it down, down to its foundations. O oh, daughter of Babylon, you devastator, happy shall they be who pay you back for what you've done to us. Happy shall they be who take your little ones and dash them against the rock. You'd say, that prayer can't be in the Bible. It is. There are such a plethora of prayers, they run the gamut from the good and the bad. Simple prayer can be good and bad. Consider Moses in 32-32 in Exodus. But now, if you will only forgive their sin, but if not, blot me out of the book that you have written. Moses interposes himself on behalf of the people of Israel and says, God, if you can't forgive them, don't forgive me. Block me out of the book of life. Uh, consider uh, the Psalms in 119, verse 97. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all day long. You see, in simple prayer, there is no pretense. You don't pretend to be more holy than we are. It's beginning prayer. It's the prayer of children. There is temptation in simple prayer to skip the representation that simplicity creates. <clears throat> Those more sophisticated want to skip the learning experience of simple prayer. Do you recall Moses at the burning bush? Well, he was told you don't know, remember that personal <laughs> That's interesting. I was there, and I didn't see you. Do you recall Moses being told to remove his shoes because he was on holy ground? He didn't know that. He didn't know he was on holy ground. We, too, are on holy ground when we pray, and we need to learn that. God can bless us where we are. He can reach us in the ordinary aspects of life. That's the stuff of prayer. But God can only bless us where we are, because that's where we are. We pace the floor with God, telling him of our hurt, our pain, and our disproportion of disappointments, because that is where we are. That's where some of us are in life, that's where some of us have been in life. Some of us have moved on into a place of health, less anxiety, and perhaps we're becoming more mature in our prayers. We should feel to complain to God or argue with God or yell at God. Oh, really? <coughs> well, 
let's look at Jeremiah. <coughs> oh Lord, you have enticed me, and I was enticed. You have overpowered me, and you have prevailed. I have become a laughing stock all day long. Everyone mocks me. That's Jeremiah 20, verse 7. How many of you have ever expressed your disappointment with God in prayer? You don't have to raise your hands. Just think about it. How many of you have ever been angry because you prayed and you prayed and you prayed? You prayed for a better job, for example, and you lost your job. How many have blamed God for not meeting their, your expectations? Most of us, I think, if we look back over our lives, can see times in which we did not achieve that which we had intended. And occasionally, we're inclined to put the blame on God. Uh, it seems to be human nature. Does he punish us for that? No. It's a, it's a difficult thing. C.S. Lewis says you lay before him what is in us, not what ought to be in us. In the, the show about the, the Jewish <coughs> fellow, um, I just went blank on the <coughs> fiddler on the roof. The fellow sings a song. <coughs> Lord, you made the lion and the lamb. You decreed what I should be what I am. Will it spoil some vast eternal plan if I were a wealthy man? <laughs> you can see him dancing on the roof, if I remember right. <laughs> if I were a wealthy man. Well, anyway. <laughs> Was that the wrong prayer for him to utter? No. No. <clears throat> One of the things that uh, is difficult for people who undertake to understand prayer is to accept the reality that God wants to hear from us. Well, that means he gets the good, the bad, and the ugly. Isn't that, that, isn't that what happens to us sometimes in life? Good and bad? Things we don't want to happen, happen? Remember that prayer, simple prayer, is an ongoing and growing relationship with God. The brokenhearted, the broods, enter into simple prayer, as do the rich and the healthy. There's no advantage here. Each person in beginning prayer will find one conclusion. One conclusion. A growing love of the Lord. Remember that even in our prayerlessness, we hunger for God, and that hunger is in itself a prayer. Mayor, uh, Mary Claire Vincent wrote, the desire for prayer is prayer, the desire, the prayer of desire. The desire for prayer is prayer, the prayer of desire. Desire will lead to practice. Practice will increase the desire and give in our lack of prayer to God. Sin separates us from God, but trying to hide our sin separates all the more. I promise. I'm going to make you a promise. Simple prayer is beginning prayer. We are indeed the subject and center of our prayers. Gradually, there will be a shift in our prayer. We will recognize that we are part of God's life. He's part of our life. But as we begin to <clears throat> mature in prayer, that will change. We will become, become part of <coughs> God's life. Oh, how? How would we become part of God's life? How can you do that? Well, you better come up with something. Becoming born again. Becoming born again. 
Yes. Well, I think the preacher last week gave a good message on that also. You're talking about Leo Tyler? Yes. Do you remember what he said? Well, about making a commitment and then following the Lord. Making a commitment, Pastor. Well, if, if we are to be part of God's life, and we assume that God has given us, each one of us, an indication of what is planned for our lives, then by performing on the plan, we are becoming part of God's life. Does that make sense to you? It's hard to realize, though, that one, we clearly learn what God's plan is for us. That's one objective. And then learning it, walking along that plan, makes us part of his life. Because it's his plan for us. And we, we've gotten so sophisticated and so sure of ourselves that sometimes we don't think about God's plan for us. Sometimes it amazes me when I think about life that God could be in control. And you say, oh, now wait a minute, you're becoming a heretic. I don't think I'm becoming a heretic by saying, I don't understand. How? He can have a plan for all of us. I don't understand that. How dynamic, how awesome, how big he must be. Everything that in today's society exists is the opposite. Today, today, we want to be in control. In fact, if you're not in control in your company, you might not be in your company in the future. If we don't think we have to be competent in everything we do, well, I acknowledge, I can't work my iPhone. <laughs> I, I understand, I can answer calls, and I can say hello, and I can call people. But the rest of this, I acknowledge, I don't know what I'm doing. But, where does that put me? With well, a lot with, of other people. With some of you, <laughs> some of you I'm, I'm equal. But for the majority of people, particularly younger ones, they would look at me aghast and say, you paid money for this and you don't know how to work it? That's only the eight-year-old. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they start very young. And I would say, well, okay. My wife can't do it either. <laughs> and many of you can't do it. Do you feel adequate or inadequate? When you have more time to do things that are worthwhile. You have more time to do? Very good. I'm going to say that from now on. When somebody says you can't work it, I'm going to say that's because I need time to do other things. Instead of just sitting there punching buttons. <laughs> yes. When I think about simple prayer, maybe I'm different from most people. I don't I really don't the only thing I ever pray for myself is to be a better Christian, a better person, to touch someone today with a smile or a hug or a kind word. Um and then I depend on Jesus. Every morning when I get up, I say, Jesus, take my hand, and we'll walk through this day together. And I don't worry about tomorrow. Uh, Pat is observing that in her prayer life, she's moved a step beyond simple prayer and has become reliant on the presence of Jesus in her life, asking in every day, and turn life over to him. I like that. How many of you? Yes? Oh, I just wondered if, if any of y'all ever prayed for God. Pray for God? Because on, once or twice in, or so in my life, I have prayed for God because I feel like, you 
know, like when you're a child, you pray for yourself, you know, you're self-centered. Then you, you begin to pray for your parents at some point. And now sometimes I pray mostly for myself but occasion, and others. But occasionally I actually pray for God because sometimes I feel compassion for him because he has to deal with us. <laughs> I'm sure that got recorded because you're close. Did, would that be picked up? No. No. But I don't need to have it out there anyway. People think you're crazy already. Uh, people think you're crazy already. Right? Actually, your lesson is going on YouTube now. My what? What's what? John's recording is going on YouTube now. What's the one does? Uh oh. Jack is, is, Jack is recording. Yeah. It's going on YouTube. Yeah. Not from this camera, but from his camera. You're on YouTube, even though you can't work yourself. <laughs> <laughs>
we were visiting some friends. And I was sitting over in that corner of the room playing with the Tinker Toys. And Nana Lalarne was over in that side of the room playing with Tinker Toys. Just a little girl. And I watched her make a club, a stick, a big thing on the end of it. And she crawled across the floor and hit me in the head. <laughs> okay, what did I do to deserve that? She had done nothing. So, no, I been sitting over there doing my, I wasn't building a club. There was no reason for her to do that, except children can be mean. Yes, they can. Where do they learn meanness? I think they're born with it, but uh, they, But Jesus said, when the parents came to sh show off their kids to him, and the disciples said, no, get them out of here, because kids were not liked in the Jewish Jerusalem. He said, no, let the little children come they're the kingdom of God. What, what do we have to do to learn to pray simply? One of the ways we do is revert to our childhood. And we pray for specifics that we want. There's nothing wrong with that. But eventually, we move from a sophisticated, self-indulgent prayer to one in which we pray for other people to have things. We pray not to be jealous of their new car, or the job, or the number of grandchildren they have. Well, now, if I prayed about that, you people would have your ears burning. I don't have any grandchildren, and I'm not going to, at the way things look. One's not married, one's married, to a rather strange woman. Forsaken. 
And then the week after that, the prayer of examine, which is a fascinating prayer. Are you with me? Yes. Yes. yes, sir. What about the prayer of Thanksgiving? Oh, the uh, prayer of Thanksgiving is the fourth okay. in the series. And uh, probably the most important one we will learn at that point, providing the foundation of everything that comes after it. The prayer of Thanksgiving, you thank God for where you are. Uh, for sunshine and rain and beauty and friends and family. You thank him for life. That's so critical. Regardless of your status in life, thank you for it. Thank you, Lord. And I'm glad you all have joined. Now, what do we have to do to get your grandson to join? I, I want him to bring our average age down. You realize how important you are. Okay. Do you have any other questions? Next week, the prayer of the forsaken. How you got in it and how you get out of it. See you then. Amen.